Okay, for the next uh, hour, you're gonna listen to Ilya. The only way I could be here was uh, offering to Harold. So thank you very much that I can listen as well. Sure. Because the spot was still open. Uh, there's a big line waiting uh, to get in as well. So I'm very excited. Okay. The floor is yours. If you've got any questions in an hour, you can ask them after Ilya's finished. So. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, right, so clearly I'm talking about um, hacking smartphones. Um, before I'll do that, a word or two about who I am. Uh, I'm Ilya, as I uh, uh, already said. I work for a company called IOActive, who uh, graciously sponsored some of my phones. I'm also part of a um, security research group uh, called Netric, and I have a uh, blog that I uh, sporadically update at best. Uh, it's been a while, but every so often I'll, I'll post something there. Um, right, so what, I, what exactly what I'll be talking about? As an introduction, I'll have some goals as to what I'm doing, what I'm not doing. Talk about entry points in smartphones and how to get there and stuff like that. I'll talk about um, how can you fingerprint a phone, like give me, I got your number, I'll figure out what phone you're using. And then I'll uh, say a word or two about um, exploiting um, bugs on smartphones. Um, Basically, this talk is the accumulation of stuff I've learned over the last uh, two or three months. I actually never owned a smartphone up until quite recently uh, when my boss said, you know, here, go play with this stuff. And so obviously they push this stuff in your hands and says, well, you know, I wonder what I can really do with this stuff. Um, I'll basically cover uh, the, the remaining three points, you know, SMS, MMS, as well as the um, cell phone applications, uh, iPhone applications, Blackberry applications, that kind of stuff. I didn't get exactly as far as I wanted to, um, so there, there's bits and pieces missing. However, um, I think there's still very interesting uh, tidbits here and there. Um, so the slide, the slide that um, could have been called, you know, my struggle with new attack surfaces and communication protocols, but that didn't sound so sexy, so I called it hacking smartphones. Um, so what's Basically, what am I not talking about? I'm not talking about any of the magic that telcos do, the baseband stuff, the SS7. I try to stay as far away from that as possible. Um, touching those kind of things can be touchy because you, you don't own the things and, and stuff like that. And, you know, it might upset people. So I'm not talking about any of those things. Um, what am I talking about? The phones and only the phones, really. I mean, I'm, you use the the cell phone network to send your stuff through, but I'm not playing with the, the, the cell phone networks themselves. Um, only the phones. Um, basically, I'm, I'm talking about, I send stuff from my phone, ends up at your phone, what can I do with that? And specifically, only attacking the application CPU, not the baseband CPU. Um, when you look at entry points for uh, smartphones or any cell phones, I've sort of divided them up in sort of three pieces, sort of the, your primary entry point, which is sort of the, I send you a text message and your phone's owned. That's obviously the most interesting one. The secondary one, uh, I didn't really end up getting much of that stuff done, but it's sort of the, you know, the apps that are on your phone by default, but you need to enable something, you know, like email or IM or something like that. Um, I sort of see that as a secondary entry point. And then sort of the last part, um, I sort of divide up into two pieces. One which I call proximity attacks, um, which is sort of these things where it, it would have been a primary entry point, except you can't just, you have to be close enough to the phone to get there. You can't just send it over um, the network. And this, of course, includes uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or the, um, I guess some of the baseband stuff. Um, and then, uh, most of all, what I call the non-zero click attacks, which is basically specific apps on your phone. Um, and clearly there's a lot of them, and, and that field's ever-growing, so I figured I should include it. And there's some interesting stuff in there. And that's actually one of the pieces where there has been... So there, there's been a lot of research about some of the SMS, MMS stuff, and there's been research about, in recent years, about the baseband stuff, and there's been research about uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and that kind of stuff. There hasn't been that much been said about... Uh, that, cell phone applications. Um, so I've got most of my interesting stuff is in there. Um, so let's start off with the primary entry points. Um, primary entry points, basically an SMS, um, EMS, which is basically just SMS, and MMS, which is just built on top of SMS, sort of. Um, so let's start off with SMS, which is on itself interesting and is basically a transport mechanism to send other stuff through. 
Uh, at its very most basic level, when you send over an SMS, it kind of looks like this. And maybe, or probably, if, if you're sitting here, you've seen this um, picture before, something that looks like it. But I figure I'll cover it anyway. Um, so the way it works is at the, the, the most simple level. And you have two users at the same provider. Um, you've got one phone, which sends an SMS submit and goes to your uh, SMS center. And the SMS center says, oh, it's this guy, and finds this guy and says, here, I got an SMS from you. And it says, it's an SMS deliver, and then the phone receives it and parses it and does what, it, uh, what it's supposed to do. Um, at a slightly more advanced level, I guess, um, would be two users at a different provider, um, where there's sort of a layer in between. I don't really care about layer in between because it's not the stuff I want to do, but it gives a somewhat clearer picture of what's going on. So basically, you send a phone to your SMSC, and the SMSC contacts the SMSC of whoever the provider is, and that one sends the deliver message. Uh, this part, I will not talk about it. That's black magic as far as I'm concerned. Um, so now that we know there's SMS, how do, you, how do you actually get your phone to send raw SMS messages? Um, and what do you send? Um, in a raw SMS PDU, basically, there's, it, it's a very trivial thing. You, the first thing you send in there, you, you, have to, you have to have the phone number of your SMSC. Um, and that one is actually pretty easy to get because they usually they, they'll push it down to you anyway. And you can just go to your uh, modem and say, "Give me the number." Um, the next thing you put in there, obviously, is um, who do you want to send it to? Another phone number, your victim, I guess. Um, and then uh, basically, there's a couple other bits and stuff in there. And then you say, you know, what kind of uh, SMS do you want to send? Usually, you want to send a uh, submit um, SMS at it. At it uh, kind of basic level sort of um, does interesting things in that um, by default it's limited to a very short uh, 160 bytes. But you can do compression, which means it can actually be decompressing and be a lot more. And the compression decompression itself is actually not, it, it's interesting in, in that it's language dependent. It isn't just, it is one algorithm, but it's depending on the language, it does different things. Um, obviously, it can do Unicode, uh, which is also interesting. And I'll say a word about that uh, later on. And um, it can also concatenate SMS messages, so there's, you can have fragmentation, which is also interesting, and I'll say another thing or two about that in a couple of slides. Um, so how do you actually get it, how do you get the, the thing to send raw SMS PDUs? Um, it isn't that, it's not really documented in the sense that the phone makers don't want you to do it, but they don't go that far out of their way to prevent you from doing it. They just don't, they're, they're not going to, they're not going to give you a document API to do it, but if you really want to do it, it's not that hard. Um, the first way I, I found out how to do it is that um, on the Android, there actually is an API to do it, sort of. It, it's there, but it, it's, a, it's a Java method, and it's a private one. But you can sort of play around with the method and, and, and make it accessible anyway. Um, doesn't some Android phones do it? Others don't support it. As luck might have it, my phone didn't do it. Just kind of annoying. Um, this is if, if you want to do it. This is how you would do it. Basically, you figure out um, the, the the method on, on your object, and then you basically mark it and say set accessible, and then you can just invoke it. <coughs> um, so I didn't go that route. What's the other way to um, send out uh, SMSs? Um, turns out these things obviously these things just um, expose a modem, and it's kind of like if you ever done uh, faxes or. or old uh, PSTN stuff. This is very familiar to you. You send out AT commands to this modem. Um, and so obviously you can, you can just do your usual AT commands, so ATA and ATD and ATH and so on. Um, those will work. Um, there's, obviously, there's also what's called extended AT commands, which is the ones that we really want to uh, uh, play with. Um, which they're called AT and then plus and then you know, some other command name. Um, turns out, um, so the old well-known ones are you know, ATA, ATH, and so forth. Um, and then some other stuff for the um, extended ones are um, if you ever play around with uh, sending out faxes, um, then that gives you a fairly good idea of what extended uh, AT commands look like. Uh, they're, not, they're not that hard to understand, though. Um, the, the, the chips actually usually do expose the phone, uh, but there's no official documentation. Uh, there is, but you have to sign away your life if you actually want to read that uh, specific documentation, because you have to sign uh, NDAs uh, from the manufacturer. Um, there is non-official documentation, of course, which is uh, fairly well understood and, and fairly well explained stuff. Um, some of the commands that are unofficially documented um, are depends on the phone. Some phones on, uh, support more than others. Um, 
But in general, most smartphones nowadays will support what you want or what you need to send out uh, raw SMS data. Um, there's actually uh, some interesting, uh, there's a really good manual about it, I have to link right there. Um, and basically, you have a, these are the, about, uh, there's about seven or eight interesting um, extended AD commands for uh, sending out raw SMS that you want to know about. Um, I'm not going to go over them, but that's basically the list of the ones you want to look at. Uh, the one that's, that is really the most interesting one is the, the CM, uh, plus CMGS, which is the one which says, here's my raw PDU, send it out right now. Don't do anything with it, just send it out. Um, and then there's other commands where it basically said, don't send it out, but store it on the phone and so forth and so forth. Um, it, it's this easy, really, to do it. Um, this, is, uh, this is on my N900 uh, Nokia phone. I did most of my developments, I should say, on the uh, Nokia N900. The reason why I did all the development on that phone is because it's not locked in any way. Um, it's basically just a Linux box on an ARM chip. And it's, it, it's made to be that way. They, they actually, if, if you go to their app store, they have an application on there, an officially supported application called um, uh, Gain Root, which is you, if you run this application, you jailbreak, or jailbreak your phone. Um, so th it's there by design. They want you to, to play around with it and write code for it and do all these things. And it comes with a, a great uh, tool chain. You've got GDB on there and, and GCC, and you've got Perl and Python and so forth. Um, so that's why I chose that phone, um, because you know, there's nothing standing in my way to do, to do things. Um, and so if you want to send out um, uh, raw text, um, and you don't even have to actually talk, I mean, you do have to talk to the modem, but the, the uh, people who made the N900 said, we're going to make a program for you, and you just talk to that program, and that one will send out, one will talk automatically to the modem, so you don't have to mess around with device names and stuff like that. It's called uh, PNAT-D, basically. And this is exactly how you, uh, this is how easy it is to send out. Uh, you, basically, you basically just type in stuff and you um, do the character turn and go straight to the modem. Um, and so the, obviously the stuff you really care about is the, the thing that's here in red, which is sort of the, the raw or hex raw bytes of the raw SMS stream that you're going to send out or SMS PDU. Um, so what does that thing really look like? Um, I'm, um, basically the, the first uh, set is based, describes the SMSC you want to talk to. It basically says, um, this thing is uh, so many bytes long, which is the first field. The second field says, I'm going to describe the address in this particular format. Um, Xerox 9.1 is one of the most common ones. I think Xerox uh, 8.1 is also a common one. There's an entire spec about, which is like 50 pages long, say, documenting a whole range of, you can, docu you can uh, do it this way, or this way, or this way, or this way. Um, there's really not, there's a lot of leeway into how you want to form the, the phone number. Um, and well, the way the length is calculated is interesting. The way that the, the, so you also have to give in the length of um, your uh, SMSC bit. Um, and the way that's basically calculated is um, that it takes the count of every byte, not every hex byte, but the count of every byte. Um, this is important because there's another number for Ron which does the length calculation differently. Um, the, second, the second byte is actually the one, uh, is one of the ones you really care about. It says, uh, it basically, it's, it's not really a byte, it is, but it's a set of bits. It basically says, you know, this bit does this, and this bit does this, and so and so. And basically, um, it allows you to say, I'm this type of, uh, I'm going to be this type of SMS, uh, a submit or deli deliver or whatever. Um, and there's a couple others in there. There's one specifically in there, which is a bit, which says, um, does this SMS PDU have a user data header or not? I'm going to talk about user data headers in a minute, uh, but you want to remember that because it's kind of important. Um, and then, you know, there's a set of, command, uh, set of uh, P PDU types. Um, the three most common ones are SMS submit, deliver, and then there's command. And there's, there's, a, a, there's a bunch of others, though. But the one you really want to care about is if, if you're going to go and try and own phones, this SMS submit because that's the one you use to send out uh, raw PDU, uh, SMS PDUs. Uh, there's a, a reference number, which is, it, it's important if you do like concatenation stuff like that, um, but you can just set it to zero, and the SMSC will generously generate one for you. Um, this is basically another sort of uh, phone field, which is nearly identical to the one for the SMSC, uh, and this is the one where you say, I want to send it to this guy. Um, the one thing that's different is that the length calculation isn't the number of raw bytes, it's the number of hex bytes. 
which is kind of weird, but I guess that's how it works. Uh, protocol identifier. I, I didn't bother to read what it is, but everyone told me that just set it to zero. So I'm like, okay, I'll set it to zero. <laughs> um, this particular byte is sort of says the encoding of the content. Um, and it, it's kind of interesting because the encoding is kind of weird. Um, by default, if you set it to zero, it does what's called GSM 7-bit uh, encoding. Um, and then there's 8-bit, uh, which is basically just raw data. And then there's, you can also set Unicode. Now, if you're going to send out uh, normal uh, text messages, um, then G GMS 7-bit is usually what you're going to use. Um, I guess depending on the country, I'm sure some countries will uh, default to Unicode. Uh, at least when I, when I play around with stuff, the phones I have, which are set for the... Uh, probably the, I live in Belgium, so they're, and they're, they're sold to me at Belgian manufacturers, and at least there, um, by default, all of the phones used 7-bit um, uh, GSM. 7-bit GSM is not, it kind of looks like ASCII, but it really isn't. And the, the, the way it works is, there's a, they have a table of 127 characters, and, they're, and so A to Z, capital, and, and lowercase, as well as numbers, map one to one to ASCII, but that's about, there's a couple special characters, but most special characters are either not there, or um, they're sort of mapped to something else. Um, and so what's interesting is that, for example, the, the at sign is mapped to the zero byte, which turns out was interesting in the past because there were a bunch of encoders and decoders written for this stuff, um, probably in the mid and late 90s. In the C language, where the zero byte has a special meaning and it costs problems in encoders and decoders because it would be the string terminator. And so you get this sort of mangled SMS if it even arrived or, or the decoding would fail or whatever. Um, I know the Perl uh, SMS uh, decoder uh, had a problem with that for a while too. It's long been fixed, but it's interesting uh, from a historic point of view that, it, that uh, they mapped this particular sign to the zero byte. Um, there's also, um, so basically what they do, so once you have this table, it's all eight bits, but it's only, they only use, they don't use the most significant bit. So what they do is, and that's why it's called seven bit, I guess, um, is they, they don't just take away the, the bit, which would be the most obvious thing to do, but they sort of shift it. So you have the, the first eight bits, and then they take the second eight bits, and the, mo the least significant bit, they sort of shift into the first one. And then you end up with uh, six bits and two unused bits, and the next one, they shift it into there. And that's the way you go all the way around until you're at the end of your message. Um, that's how it works. Um, the other interesting thing is, um, if you look at this table, there's, you have got a bunch of characters in there, and then there's a bunch of like Greek, um, Greek signs and whatnot, stuff I've never touched in my entire life. Um, and, and, and they're all in this table. And then I think when somebody made a table, I said, oops, you know, we, we, we forgot a couple of characters, but the table's full, what do we do? Some of the characters they forgot was the carrot sign, the backslash, and the um, curly brackets, and, and the pipe, stuff that people like us might use if, if you want to send something to someone, chances are some of these characters might be in there. Um, so they said, oh, we'll, we'll have a special case for these ones. We'll, instead of use one byte, we'll use two bytes for this one. And so for these um, uh, six or seven characters, there's uh, two bytes instead of one byte. And then those two bytes, again, get uh, encoded into uh, the two eight bytes into basically the, the seven bit encoding. Um, so, and the rest is basically the content. Uh, Pendant with a length field, and then you basically just have your um, uh, PDU content. Um, so that's, if, that's how you send it out, and that's how it looks. Now, I mentioned earlier there's this bit about the user data header. That one's actually really important because what I described earlier, this thing is basically, it only sent, that's a, a text message, as in just text, I send it to you, and it, there's only, it's only, it doesn't, it doesn't carry application data or anything like that. It can't do that. Uh, but if you set this user uh, data header, um, all of a sudden it can. Um, so the, the way it works is sort of that your um, uh, SMS content now has an extra header in there, which is the user data header. And that one's actually a very simple uh, type linked values uh, set where you can have a, a, a number of uh, types of links and values. Um, and they basically just look like this. So it's this very simple thing where, you know, you've got one type length value and two type length value and so and so and so until you got to the end of your type length value. Um, so it's a very trivial thing. And so you can have a, a I guess, well, you can have unlimited as in, there's a limit as to the amount of data you can send, but in, in theory, I guess, the, there's no limit as to how much you can send. Um, um, so 
basically, uh, so the, the type basically gives you, says what kind of uh, content is, or what kind of specific uh, application type SMS am I going to be? Um, and all of these are potential entry points um, for if you want to go and break uh, phones. And they allow sending of uh, uh, the WAP and graphics and ringtones. And there's a, there's a spec that defines this stuff. And the, the list is huge. And all this stuff is stuff that potentially gets parsed by uh, phones. And there's EMS stuff in there. And there's a, a WAP push and, and uh, other kinds of uh, specific SMS control stuff in there. This is all fun stuff to sort of play with. And you know, the table continues, because it's a very long table. And there's even more stuff in there, but I figured I'm not going to waste three slides on it. Um, so the other thing about uh, SMS, which I sort of mentioned earlier, is that it supports uh, fragmentation, compression, and Unicode. In, this is very interesting from an uh, attacker point of view, because uh, fragmentation, we all know, if, if you looked at any of the interesting um, TCPIP kind of stuff in the uh, mid and late 90s. There's all sorts of funny things you can do if you, if you end up having fragmentation of protocol. Um, SMS is kind of similar to that, so they will, there will most likely be similar issues, I think. Uh, at least there's been already one, I think, last year by um, uh, um, Charlie uh, something. I can't remember his name. Um, but it was a buffer overflow in the, uh, in the iPhone, which was specifically about um, the fragmentation of SMS messages. Um, the other thing I've been thinking about is if you do the uh, SMS, so one of the things that initially, if you look at the TCP IP version of fragmentation, is that this stuff has been used to do, to do IDS evasion. So I'm thinking you could probably do the same thing to avoid um, lawful interception, where if, they, if, if you, whatever lawful interception appliance um, concatenates all these SMS together, they get a very different view than what's actually being sent over. Um, so there might be something to that. Um, second of all, there's um, compression in there. So compression, again, you know, if, you, if you look at stuff like Setlim and stuff like that, not always trivial to get right implementation-wise. So there's definitely potential there to look at uh, compression for uh, potential bugs in, in, in uh, phones. The other thing I'm thinking is uh, decompression bombs. It, it may not lead to buffer flows, but it might lead to you know, your um, SMS parser suddenly dying. And it turns out in most phones, if your SMS parser dies, you're not going to receive anything. Anymore. You have to, your phone's not dead, but you're not going to receive or send out SMS or, or, or uh, phone calls like that. I know at least Android works like that. Uh, so you have to basically reboot the phone to restart the um, telephony application. And uh, uh, lastly, the um, SMS also supports Unicode, um, which, again, is interesting because there have been, a, if you look historically at a Unicode implementation, there have been uh, issues with buffer overflows and encoding and decoding. Um, there have been issues with um, sort of trying to validate something in, in Unicode, and then you map it to ASCII, and then you get this two to, uh, or many to one mapping, and you get totally different characters. Um, so there's interesting stuff, or potential interesting stuff, with uh, Unicode and the SMS, too. Um, so that's as far as my uh, SMS intro goes. Second part, MMS. Um, MMS, at its basic part, again, sort of the graph, which we saw earlier, but now instead of SMS, we're talking about MMS. It's, I guess, if you look at it from high level architecturally, sort of kind of the same in the sense that I send my MMS, I upload it to my uh, MMS center, and the MMS center goes back to whoever I want to send it to, but it doesn't actually deliver the content there. It, it sends an SMS and says, um, hi, I'm a, a, a WAP push, push message, basically, which is really goes over SMS and says, hi, I've got content for you. Here's a URL. Why don't you go and fetch it? And then it goes to the, uh, the uh, WAP server installed by the telco provider and goes there and fetches the content. To, to play with this and to test it um, is kind of annoying. You don't want to do this. Uh, Mostly because um, you run into the telco, and first of all, if you start putting funny stuff in there, some of their stuff might break, and they may not like it, and if they don't like it, um, they're going to come after you, or more likely, they're going to send their lawyers after you. Um, so you don't want to do that. Um, and even if, you don't, even if you don't break anything, it still generates a lot of noise, and you still end up in the stuff where the telco provider may not want you to play around with this stuff. Um, so the way to fix it is actually really easy. Um, this message, you can just forge it. You can build it yourself, because it just goes over as a message. You can just forge it, send it out, and so you avoid the whole MMS thing. Um, so you send it yourself, and you say, you give them a link, and you say, why don't you go to my web server? 
Instead of, right? That's how it works. I didn't come up with this, by the way. This has been done before. But I thought it's, it's, a, it's a very fun thing to do. And so now you also afford. So, if, if the, so in the previous picture, if the MMS if, if implemented in the sense that they said, we're going to make sure and we're going to do IDS detection and, um, and shell code detection and, and, and this kind of stuff, and we're going to re encode images to make sure nobody can do any funny business, then all of a sudden you just circumvented it, right? Um, so that's, that's how you would do it. And this is stuff that's this very easy to do. Um, so how, would you, how do you go about doing that? So you have to set the um, UDH bit in your SMS PDU, and then you have the uh, uh, UDH header, which I'll show in the next slide. And then there, basically, you fill in the, the bits. And then after that, you fill out the, um, w, the, the uh, WAP um, data. And at the end of that, there's a link where you can basically set your stuff and send it to the phone, and the phone will go out and get it. Um, so what does the UDH look like in this case? It's basically just, uh, uh, what's that, I guess, seven bytes? Basically, so, the, 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 so here you have the uh, length, type, and uh, value. And basically, the length is because it's six bytes, obviously. And five is basically which says, I, I'm, I'm a 16-bit uh, WAP port, or an application port, and, these are, and, I, and you've got two ports. It's kind of like TCP and UDP, and that the stuff basically uses 16-bit ports. And there's a source port and destination port. So in that sense, it's very much like TCP and UDP. Um, and then obviously there's a length field describing you know, the, the length of this stuff. Even though you wouldn't need one, because they're defined to be 16-bit. But it's there anyway. So that's how you do it, right? And so if you want to have an, uh, the MS specifically, or the MS notification, um, then you have to have a specific source port, specific destination port. Uh, the source port is always uh, 2948. Destination port is uh, 9200. Um, and that's basically the uh, WAP push. Um, and then basically you have to, if you look at the spec of WAP push, this, this stuff's pretty hairy though, but it's, it's all fairly well documented. Um, then basically after your header, there's sort of this, um, I guess, application data, which is... Uh, it's called uh, binary XML, and the reason why, obviously, is because uh, normal um, XML is, is um, very verbose, and it's, it's, there's so much redundancy in there, you don't need all that crap. So they sort of compress it into sort of what they call binary XML, which is a very, very weird thing. And, and binary XML in itself is very interesting because there's length fields and sizes and offsets and indexes in there. So that's stuff you can play around with. Very interesting entry point. Um, um, and basically, it's got to come from the right source port and destination port. Um, as mentioned earlier. Um, so if, if you actually want to forge it, this is how it will look, basically. And I, because uh, I, I had to play with stuff around, so I documented, for, at least I think I documented fairly well in my uh, source code. Um, it's basically the way you do it is, first thing you gotta say, what, it, what is, you have to actually describe the content of, that's inside the content of your SMS PDU. Say, what is this? Describe the thing that it is. And so you say it's a, it's a MMS message. And then you say, well, what kind of SMS is this? Well, it's, not, it's an, uh, a notification MMS. So, OK, that's very interesting. It's what kind of version? What's version 1? And so you've got to fill out more and more of this crap. Um, you've got to say, well, it's the, the size. And then stuff like, um, say, what's the message size? But what's the size of the size of the message size? And stuff like that that you've got to play with. Um, and then once you get through all of this sort of uh, boilerplate stuff, finally at the end you say, here's where I want you to go and fetch stuff for me. Um, oh, and so uh, in, in binary XML, all the, I guess I forgot to put it in there, all the, all the I guess, strings that are still left over in binary XML, basically the way they, they they're not, there's no length field describing them most of the time. Um, it's really just, it's kind of like uh, the C program language where Every, by every string in binary XML just ends with a zero byte. Um, so again, zero byte has special meaning. Well, so that's how it looks, basically. This is, so this is basically how you, how you would send it out. Uh, interesting point of view from there is that um, you can, I didn't put it in here, but you can, ha or you can omit it. Um, but you can have a from number in there, um, which isn't validated by anyone. So you can basically spoof it and say, you know, someone you don't like, you could maybe send them an MS with some nasty pictures and then spoof it from somebody, somebody else, right? Uh, so you could pull tricks like that. Uh, obviously, the binary XML itself is a, a great entry point. Um, there's so much crap that has to be parsed in there. Um, I haven't heard of any yet that have been broken, but there's got to be piles and piles of stuff in there in, in the smartphones. Um, 
The other thing in there is that um, once the, uh, you give the URL, the, the client goes to my web service, is that it's really kind of a, it's a, it's a user agent, right? It's a very trivial uh, browser, basically. Um, so that exposes HTTP-like parsing and content, and, and so you can play tricks there too. And then basically it uh, fetches uh, an XML file with a bunch of headers in there, and then there's your binary content, which is usually like uh, an audio format or video format or whatnot. Um, also because it has to go out, um, it may expose TCP stack. Now that depends on your provider and stuff like that, because some of them will use proxies, and if you use proxies, they won't. But if, if uh, some of them uh, may very well say, well, why don't you just use your own TCP IP stack and then go fetch this stuff. Um, um, so may or may not expose P TCP IP stack depending on settings and, and telco provider and, and things like that. Um, but again, if, if it does expose TCP IP stack, that's a huge um, entry point because for, on, on the desktop side and the server side, TCP IP stacks are fairly well tested. On the embedded side, not so much. Um, there's a bunch of embedded appliances that easily break if you, if you run Nmap on this stuff, they break, right? So chances are phones are fairly similar. Um, so that's the MMS sending part. Um, I'll go into uh, secondary entry points or, uh, so I didn't actually, because I sort of rushed this thing together, I didn't actually end up, um, I, didn't, and I didn't have enough time to look into the secondary entry points. Um, most smartphones use of email. Obviously, there's interesting stuff in there, uh, fee card parsing, uh, HTML header, um, email headers, that kind of stuff, um, uh, attachments. Uh, but I haven't looked at it. Um, so I will in the future, but I haven't gotten there yet. Um, so let's look at the third entry point, and I'll start with the proximity attacks, and I'll move on to the application uh, uh, um, stuff. Um, so basically, proximity attacks, I've sort of divided up into uh, three or well, four pieces, which is basically what uh, most phones either come or used to come with, is basically uh, Bluetooth or uh, Wi-Fi and your own little baseband, right? Um, so I'm not going to talk much about Bluetooth. This stuff is pretty well understood. Um, there's been work about this. Uh, a lot of security research from this stuff, uh, mostly by the Trifinite guys, uh, uh, Martin, Marcel, Adam. A bunch of people have looked into this stuff. I'm not going to talk about it today. Um, it would be a waste of your time for me to talk about this, because there are people about it, people who understand this stuff much better than I do. Um, Erda I will talk about. Um, initially, when I looked at this phone, I said, well, you know, why don't I go do Erda? And, and you start to look up, and very few people have ever done, from, have done any security research on Erda. It's always, if you look at these sort of phone stuff, they'll, people always mention, oh, you have uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and then there's Erda. And then there's been stuff done on Bluetooth and, and Wi-Fi, but nobody ever looked at Erda. Um, I was like, oh, that's interesting. Why don't I go look at that? Now I, now I found out why nobody's ever done it. Um, because nobody ships phones anymore with Erda on it. Some, <laughs> it turns out that's the way it is, I found out. Um, some phones, like the N900, do have an IR transceiver, but they said, we're not going to give you an Erda stack. Screw you. Um, it's there because you can use it as a remote control, which makes sense, um, but you can't do the URL anymore. Um, I tried very hard to find a phone somewhere that, uh, on, uh, in, in uh, mobile stores near where I live, because um, to find a phone that they would sell me that uh, has URL, I couldn't find one. Uh, I, I've been told there are still a, a couple out there, but um, I couldn't find one. Um, so, but I still thought, this is, well, there's none, nothing down there, I want to go look at it. Um, and then, uh, so, but I'll only observe this from a distance because I never got to send it to an actual phone. Um, when I started looking at some of the Erda stuff, and you know, the first thing you do is when you hear about something, you say, well, why don't I Google the stuff and see what comes up? There was a very interesting uh, security advisor that came out from Microsoft about a decade ago about the denial of service buffer overflow um, in their Erda stack in Windows 2000s. The advisor is very interesting. In that it says so and so and so, and it's a um, it's the URL stack, and it's a, a, a conduct a buffer overflow and cause an access violation in the Windows kernel, and then they go on and say this cannot be used to run malicious code. Absolutely cannot be used. I don't know about that. I didn't look at a specific bug, but I, I think that's kind of a bold claim to say. On one hand, we have a buffer overflow which we know causes uh, an access violation. On the other hand, we're here to tell you that there's no way this can be exploited. Tricky thing to do. Um, 
I guess that it kind of makes sense if you look at the dates. It was done 10 years ago. Nowadays, probably Microsoft wouldn't put out an advisor like that anymore. But it's interesting, it's never been corrected. It's still there, that's how it looks, that's how it is. Um, so I, I just thought it was interesting to sort of see denial of service and heap corruption is in the same. It doesn't make sense to me, right? If, if you have heap corruption, at the, even if you don't examine further, at least you have to allow for the possibility that somebody else who's smarter than you or has more time than you or is more committed can figure out a way to exploit that buffer overflow. Um, so I think that's a very bold claim to say that cannot be exploited. Um, so basically, or the, this is the way the protocol looks. There's a, um, a bunch of, pro the, the low level protocols are mandatory and then the high level protocols are sort of, oh, are we gonna support um, Ethernet over ERTA or are we gonna do OBEX um, or are we gonna do so and so? These are optional protocols. Um, but, and so if you were to attack ERTA, obviously you wanna look at the low level protocols because that's the, the fun stuff, right? Again, I never had a phone, so I didn't actually get to go there and do this stuff, but I do have access to the Linux kernel sources. And it's like, well, why not go poke around there for a little while and spend about half an hour pulling up the uh, Linux um, uh, networking stack, specifically the URDA stack. Um, this stuff's a mess. I mean, this, I, again, I think nobody ever looked at it from a security point of view. I spent half an hour on this stuff. I got uh, three buffer overflows in there. Um, and not hard ones. This is very trivial stuff, like string copy, string overflows in the Linux kernel, right? Um, so, interesting though, when I uh, went to submit the three bugs I had, turns out one of them was already fixed. Which, so at least somebody, I guess somebody looked at some point. Um, so, when I looked at stuff, I was like, well, you know, this stuff is right for the picking. Chip, you know, it's fucking dead. Um, the phones don't have it which kind of bugged me. It was like, okay, well, at least I have some interesting bugs to show. Um, <laughs> um, other appliances that, um, that use Linux kernel that do use the Erda stack uh, obviously used to be vulnerable to this. Uh, bugs have been fixed for a month, month and a half or so. Um, but they used to have them. Um, but clearly no phones have them anymore. Um, so the first one is actually sort of the, uh, we take a binary string, but really want to use it as a, a C string in our code. Why don't we take the length that you tell me the string is and use that one to zero terminate this, uh, this thing in memory without actually validating your length. That's a very trivial, very clear case of uh, buffer overflow. You can just say this length is not five bytes, but it's really uh, uh, 255 bytes, and the buffer's only five bytes, and you, so you smash a byte. Very clear case. Um, other one, again, uh, very clear string-based buffer overflow. Um, this one was my favorite of the three in the sense that um, whoever wrote this actually went out of his way to try and make sure there's some validation done um, because there's, a, there's clearly a length check being done, except the length check basically says the data we're going to read from, make sure that that buffer we're going to read from is big enough, except there's never a second bound check which says the buffer we're going to write to, make sure that buffer is big enough too. Um, so it's kind of sort of this... Well, we, we, we think we did all of it, but, and then you missed the, the, the more critical uh, bug in, in the code. Um, and then, I, again, you know, the string-based buffer overflow, and then zero terminate. so both of these things basically cause an overflow. Um, so that's uh, uh, sort of my sort of, uh, exploration of, of, of the uh, Erda stack. Um, again, I, I briefly looked at some of the Wi-Fi stuff. Um, there's a, a lot of stuff done in... Uh, uh, looking at a series of Wi-Fi stacks. Um, I, I spend all of about 10 minutes looking at this stuff. Um, uh, basically, what I did do is, um, there's a, 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 a um, Scappy, which is an interesting networking tool, which has some, uh, which supports uh, most of the, the low-level uh, Wi-Fi protocols, and it also uh, so has a bunch of uh, fuzzing methods. So it's like, and there's actually a presentation where someone says, this is how to do it. So I read the presentation and says, oh, well, let's do this and see what comes out. Um, not that much luck, so at least the stacks are in incredibly bad shape, but then again, I only spend about 10 minutes on this stuff. Um, so, but if you want to do it, you know, you follow the steps here, you send out uh, fuzz beacons and stuff like that, and hopefully you'll have more luck than I have uh, when you're um, fuzzing the Wi-Fi stacks of uh, smartphones. Um, oh, and I, yeah, I got this, because this is not my slide, I got this from another slide deck, a presentation someone else did. It which uh, it's very interesting on, uh, in its own, uh, which is a black hat presentation. 
Um, so the baseband stuff, I, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't touch it. I stayed far away from it, but it's there. It's an interesting entry point if somebody wants to look at it. Um, that's uh, definitely one of the interesting things to do. And I think quite recently, some, someone from the University of Luxembourg actually found a bunch of really interesting uh, baseband bugs in like what the four baseband stacks that are actually shipped. Um, but I, I know there's, there's been, in the last two or three years, in the open source community, there's been uh, a tremendous amount of uh, coding done in terms of trying to um, allowing you know, mere mortals such as myself or anybody else to do the baseband type stuff. And so you had OpenBSC and OpenBTS and that kind of stuff. Um, I didn't go there because, first of all, I don't, it would, it's massive ramp up time and you have to buy the hardware. But most of all, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure how legal it is where, 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 I, where I live. So it's kind of like I don't really want to get in trouble just with playing around with the stuff. Um, so I, I said, interesting, very cool people doing it, but I'm not touching it. Um, so now we get to the sort of non-zero click remote attacks or the um, sort of the applications that the, the, the third, the highest, more high, high level layer of smartphones. Um, turns out this stuff does take a while to um, get up and running and, and play around with. Um, so initially I had a set of six, um, six seven phones I was going to uh, play with. Um, I only made it, um, only ended up playing with two phones. Um, I did a little bit of Android stuff, but I didn't get, any, I didn't get anywhere in terms of security. Um, so I'm going to cover um, iPhone specifically, and then there's going to be a little bit of uh, Blackberry stuff in there. Um, and this stuff is very much in the works, and I've got interesting things in there, but I don't have them in my slides because they're not finished yet, and there's a bunch of questions I have. Um, this is definitely very ongoing. Um, the, and this is sort of where you get, sort of go from, you know, we've covered all the stuff which is sort of the standards and described, and every phone does it in the same way, and now you get to the point where every phone is very different, in that every environment of every phone is very different. Um, it's all described the environment of every, of those two phones I looked at um, in the slide, and then basically go into, this is security-wise, this is kind of tricky on this phone, this is kind of tricky on this phone, and so and so. Um, so, we'll start off with the iPhone, which is the one I, I played around with most, and which is very interesting because it also very much resembles uh, macOS since it's sort of a port of macOS to the ARM CPU. I mean, there's lots of changes and, and stuff like that, but at its very core, it really is just macOS and an ARM chip. Um, and so, since it's basically macOS ported to an ARM chip, uh, it, it has a similar development environment in that uh, most stuff, especially the GUI stuff, is all Objective-C. Uh, and I'll talk about that more. In a, uh, and so the, well, the cool part about Objective-C basically is that it's, it's not, most of, most of the phones actually, like Android and, and Blackberry and so on and so on, they don't give you uh, a native language. They say, you know, here's a very limited set of APIs, usually Java, and you only get to play with that. Um, Mac OS doesn't do that. I mean, they restrict it in terms of policy, but not technology-wise. So you can actually go out and build an app and say, say do so and so and so, or, there might be apps that, that do, just, I mean, there's still kind of a black box, but it's not really that hard to break. Um, so um, you have the sort of low-level native code apps running on uh, iPhones. Um, and they're all Objective-C, so they, parts of it will do their own memory management, stuff like that. And so that's interesting because you know there's going to be buffer overflows and, and things like that in there. Um, so I'm not... I'm not going to talk, by the way, about some of the buffer overflow, overflows of standard C-type C -type stuff, because that's fairly well understood, and I'm going to try and limit it to specific iPhone application stuff. Um, first part is um, that the thing about iPhone apps is that, as I mentioned earlier, is that they don't really try to limit you uh, technology-wise. They, really, they only try to limit you um, policy-wise. Because you have a native language, you know, there's only so much you can limit, right? Uh, so but they'll, they'll say, you can't do this and you can't do that, and we're not going to give you an API to do this. But it's, it's C, so if you don't give me an API, I'll build my own API. Um, but if you stick to the standards um, and stick to the APIs and you want your app to get, go to the App Store, one of the things you can't do is, or you're not allowed to do is to talk to other applications which is very annoying because one of the things iPhone application developers want to do is they want their apps to talk and exchange data and stuff like that. So they figured out a, a sort of hack around it, which is um, the use of URL handlers, um, which is kind of sort of um, a problem. So basically what happens is they, the application will register an own URL handler and they'll have a, a callback function for that and then the other application basically 
calls that URL and spins up your application and sends it a bunch of data. Very simple IPC mechanism. Um, kind of looks like this if, if, you, if, if you were to develop this kind of stuff. Um, so it's basically the handle open URL uh, API. Um, problem, anybody can do it because it's a global URL handler. If you, if you have an app that does this and your mobile Safari goes to my web page and I say, well, why don't I call that application? Then all of a sudden, I get to talk and send specific data to that one application that you have that I didn't really expect. So that's an unintended consequence. Um, people are sort of very, very slowly figuring out that, well, maybe we should just do some validation there. Um, but initially when this stuff came out, and most applications that do this stuff don't validate any of this stuff. So there's very interesting consequences in there in, in the sense that the data that's coming in in these handlers is also trusted or assumed to be trusted. Um, so if you find a bunch of applications that registers URLs and you play with it, just from if someone if someone browses your web to your um, uh, some iPhone user browses to your uh, website, they get to send all this arbitrary sort of interesting data to these IPC mechanisms um, uh, that applications have registered. Um, and there are literally thousands of apps that have URL handlers. And there's actually a website of documents and stuff. And if you go there. Uh, looks like this, and the first thing it says is shared and draft communication. Now, isn't that fantastic? Um, and there's, because uh, if, yeah, basically, if you look at this website, it'll list, probably not all, but most applications says, since you're online, it does so and so and so, so you have great documentation right there. Uh, uh, obviously, a source of inspiration. Um, so, the other thing about the iPhone, and this is the thing I really, or the, the thing I like, really like the most is that. Um, you can have cross-site scripting in the iPhone. And now, I know if you say cross-site scripting, you're like, well, okay, you know, I've been there and it's web app stuff, and it's only, not really on the iPhone, it's slightly different. And so, basically, on the iPhone, they have uh, what's called a UI web view class. And it's basically, it's a way to build up a GUI. There's different ways to build up a GUI in the iPhone, but this is one of them. And this one in particular is used usually in um, cooperation with a web app. If you, if you have, if you have an app, send out an application for an iPhone, which is supposed to be a, um, a, a GUI or a front end for a web application, then nine times out of, out of 10, a UI web view will be used. Now that's interesting because what a UI web view really does is it basically says, build up a bunch of uh, HTML, raw HTML, you hand it off to the UI web class and say, render this stuff. And it basically sort of a, kind of like a browser. Obviously vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Um, you know, if, if you, if, if no sanitation is done or there's not a sufficient uh, escaping of data, it can be vulnerable to um, uh, cross-site scripting. Um, at a very basic level, there's no cookie, so you don't, can't do that. But since this, this, this thing is a UI and it will obviously have interesting stuff from your, from, uh, in, or hopefully we'll have some interesting stuff on the phone, you can just sniff the entire UI and send it back to, you know, if you send it back to yourself. Um, that's sort of the very basic level. It gets worse. Um, by default, there's no, so it, it's just HTML and you can have JavaScript in there and you can script this stuff, but there's no bridge back from Objective-C or from, jo from JavaScript to Objective-C, um, which I'm sure was intentional, except iPhone developers looked at this and said, yeah, but I really want there to be a bridge because I think this stuff is cool and interesting and I want it to be there. Um, so there's a way um, that you can actually build one and lots of iPhone developers saw this and said, oh, great, let's implement this stuff. And so there's a, you can um, create a hook, which is a should start loading with requests, which is basically a URL handler, but very specific to that uh, UI web view. So it's not a global one. Only, that, only stuff that's written in that particular view gets to call that URL handler um, uh, and basically pass data to it. Now, the assumption here is that when people build this stuff is that when this stuff is being sent, sent through this URL handler, is that it's only going to be trusted data that's built up for the UI to render, which is true, except if you have cross-site scripting, because if you have cross-site scripting, the content's no longer trusted, right? Um, so um, basically, um, that means the, the, these URL hooks are not built to handle and trust data. Everything that goes in there, I mean, Nine, nine out of 10 of these things that I've seen, they break instantly, the, like out of bound indexes, and stuff like that. Because they assume, every so I've seen one that had a, like pointers in there and stuff like that, where they basically said, well, take a blob of data, put it in the UI, and then the UI will send it back to me, stuff like that. Um, so 
if you get cross site scripting in these kind of things, depending on the application, depending on what they do with the with, uh, URL handling, um, you can get memory corruption and stuff, stuff like that in there. Um, now it gets even worse in the sense that um, people have said that this is very interesting, but what I really want is I don't just want to handle some data. What I really want is I want my JavaScript application to be able to call um, arbitrary object of C methods and basically call native code. Um, and so there's uh, code out there which basically serializes and unserializes um, arbitrary method names and arbitrary arguments. Um, and people use this stuff, and this is basically what it looks like. And so this, this is really cool because if you have, this is like by design, right? So if you have cross-site scripting an application that works this way, and does the serialization and unserialization of object C um, function names or method names and parameters, then obviously, you know, you're, you're done. You've got code execution right there. Um, so I, I, I thought that was very interesting. Um, the next type is sort of formatting bugs. I know formatting bugs are obviously very well understood. And the, sort of the myth about formatting bugs is that they're mostly dead because they're so easy to detect and everybody, nobody has them in applications anymore. Well, in come the iPhone developers who have no concept whatsoever of native languages and they see this Objective-C language and then they sort of play around with it. And, and if you stick to the Objective-C uh, objects, you're mostly okay. I mean, you're not. You're mostly okay from the application uh, developer point of view. The, meta, the, the objects themselves have issues too, but you know, that's a problem for Apple, not for the developer. Um, so if you stick to those objects, you're kind of okay. So you're not going to. Most iPhone apps don't have that many, or shouldn't have that many buffer overflows and stuff like that, because they're going to use these Objective C objects, which can handle uh, uh, strings in a very elegant way and things like that. Um, but these methods do come with format functions, and so you. More, from the iPhone applications that I've seen so far, there are more formatting bugs than there are um, buffer overflows and, and read AVs and that kind of stuff. Buffer overflows, uh, formatting bugs are rampant among iPhone applications, as far as I have seen in the ones that I've investigated. Um, so basically, yes, they can lead to formatting bugs. Um, iPhone developers, they don't really, I, I'm sure they know what a format string function is, in the sense that it's documented, but they don't understand the consequences of doing it wrong. Nobody ever told them and said, don't do this, because if you do this, horrible things, these foreign specifiers have special meanings, and they pop stuff from the stack, and they handle pointers and stuff like that. IPhone develop, most iPhone developers um, don't know this stuff. At least, I, I don't know if they don't know this stuff, but it's evident from the, co the code I've examined and the applications I've looked at that they, as far as I know, they don't know. Um, these are the methods that look that um, these are specific um, Objective C methods, basically, except for the NS log function, um, that are basically just Objective C um, methods that are potentially vulnerable to format string bugs if used incorrectly. Um, now they're sort of different from your standard format um, string function um, in that. Um, they don't support the percent uh, format specifier, which is the thing that makes formatting bugs really cool because it allows you to write data to arbitrary positions. You don't have that um, in Objective-C format uh, functions. I'll talk about this in the next section, um, but th there's a punchline to this, I, I promise. Um, and next, the, basically, I guess a special application in the iPhone is the browser. Um, the iPhone browser is a disaster waiting to happen. This stuff will parse anything you throw at it, and the user doesn't know. Like, they'll browse on my web page, and they're, they're not going to tell you there's an Office document you want to download or parse it. It says, there's an Office document, and I'm going to parse it whether you like it or not. And it does that with, uh, doc with RTF files, too, and, and MP3, and PDF, and all sorts of stuff. There's a, a long, long list of this kind of stuff. Um, but let's talk about... Uh, the Office ones, because Office is very interesting in that it's a very, very complex file format and it's very hard to parse and nobody can do it correctly. And obviously that would include uh, Apple. Um, basically, it's, it's, not, it's a parser, but it, they don't render the, um, uh, or interpret it as, um, off, as Office documents in the sense that they convert it. So they take your Office, whatever, and they convert it to HTML. Um, and there's this, they have a utility or a library for this called Office Import, which, by the way, is a private API, so you can't touch it as a developer, but it's there. Um, Office Import, I think, um, I think a vulnerability, the first vulnerability, as far as I know, public first vulnerability for Office Import um, came out about two months ago in iDefense Advisory. Um, 
there will be more. I'm very confident there's going to be more. Um, and the sort of thing, basically, what the advisory says um, for this um, vulnerability says, basically says the same thing that I just said, which is this, um, this stuff parses automatically. You know, it will parse it whether you don't want it or not, and it stays saved. It's kind of similar to the way Office 2000 used to work you know, a decade ago. Microsoft has since learned from their mistake and says, we're not going to do this. We're going to ask the user if they want to do it. Um, obviously, the reason why you don't want to do this is because you have a very rich feature set. But the reason you say, we're not going to parse automatically is for security reasons, obviously. Um, oops. So um, the only thing I all right, the only thing I want to say is that I'm pretty confident there's going to be more because first of all, office formats are incredibly hard to parse, and uh, you know, same thing here. Second of all, I actually played around fuzzing with this stuff. Very, very trivial dumb fuzzing, manual dumb fuzzing, as in I make a file, change a bit, parse it, bam, things thing blows up. Um, so. <laughs> And th this, this was about 20 tries of me changing a couple of bits. Um, so this stuff is very, very sort of shaky and wonky. Um, and there's, I mean, that, that's like ripe for the picking, right, the office import. Um, so the second one I'll talk about and sort of, um, is, I spent much less time looking at the BlackBerry because um, I s spent a fair amount of time mucking around and playing around with um, the uh, uh, iPhone, because one, I just told you about a bunch of these cool features, and, and two is that the iPhone, in terms of playing around from a security point of view, is far less restricted than the BlackBerry. The BlackBerry does a lot of things right, whereas the, the iPhone guys didn't, I, I wouldn't say did things wrong, but they just didn't really consider security when they implemented this kind of stuff. Um, BlackBerry is, uh, they've got their own OS. Um, I don't know if it's based on anything, I, I, I don't think so, I don't know. Um, but it's proprietary and there isn't that much known about it as far as I know. The applications are all written in Java, there's, uh, it's all managed, they've got a bunch of extensions for their own. Um, the only thing I, can, I know that I've looked at and seen and then where things go wrong about the BlackBerry is that the, the BlackBerry, unlike the iPhone, um, does allow apps to talk to each other and share information and so you know, developers don't have to invent these wonky IPC mechanisms. And the way they do it is they have these uh, persistent storage objects and they're really sort of, they have 64-bit identifiers and, and, you, and you put stuff in there and an application can pick it up and go there. By default, the ACLs are basically there saying anybody can touch this stuff, which is interesting from a privacy point of view, where if you have one application which stores a, a set of data that you really don't want anybody else to, to read, such as you know, cryptographic keys and that kind of stuff. I've seen that happen, by the way, where people say, oh, well, take your crypto keys and just put them in uh, this uh, prison storage and have no ACLs on it. Um, um, so that's the thing, right? There's no ACLs on there by default. Um, the good thing, though, is that this is very much documented. If you go to the BlackBerry Develop website, they'll tell you, you know, we have ac you can put ACLs on this stuff, and if you're going to put sensitive stuff in this, in here, you better damn well have ACLs. Um, so it's all documented, but it's not on by default, and so um, there's a, a set of BlackBerry applications that when they do persistent storage, they won't do the ACLs, and if they, oh, I would imagine, <laughs> actually, I would imagine that there's at least a, a couple of BlackBerry applications that source sensitive content in these persistent objects without using ACLs. Um, so that's, that's really the only thing, I haven't spent that much time in BlackBerry, but that's the only one thing I could find where I was like, well, you know, that's, applications are vulnerable to this kind of stuff. Um, and this is, if, if, you, if you were to ever audit um, BlackBerry applications, it, it would kind of look like this, basically. That's, that's how it uses uh, persistent object stuff. So I talked about the iPhone browser. Um, I spend a little bit of time playing around with the BlackBerry browser. I know people say it sucks from a functionality point of view. So from a security point of view, it doesn't suck, at least not as badly as the iPhone one, in the sense that um, they will not parse, they will parse very, very little that you throw at it. Almost always they will say, do you want to download this? And you don't even, you have to download it first, you don't get to render it immediately. You have to download it first and then you can say, well, I really want to open this stuff. Um, so from that point of view, the, the, the browser is significantly better than the iPhone. Um, I haven't really sort of looked beyond uh, this part. Um, 
in the uh, library applications. Um, but the general sense I'm getting is that if you compare it to the iPhone, you know, people put thought into the stuff, and the stuff from a security point of view works a lot better than the iPhone from a security point of view. Um, okay, so the next, uh, so this is sort of the, I guess, general entry points. Now I'll talk about, you have a bunch of entry points and you maybe have an interesting bug. How do you figure out what kind of phone someone has before, because you don't want to call them up and say, well, what kind of phone do you have, because I really want to own you. You don't do that, right? You want to, right? <laughs> you want to write a fingerprinting application to say, to figure out what kind of phone they have without asking them. As I mentioned earlier, um, when you do this sort of uh, your own MMS handling, is that um, there's a, um, a user agent, and the user agent goes, goes to your web server and says, hi, I'm user agent so-and-so, give me content. That is absolutely perfect for fingerprinting, right? Again, I didn't come up with this stuff. It was a, um, a, a guy uh, in the States uh, called Zane Lackey who came up with stuff and built a tool for this. And, and, um, and then he said, I'm, I was asked by telco providers not to release the tool. Um, so we didn't release it. I have code for it, and I will release it. <laughs> um, not his code, I wrote my own, but give me a couple of days and I'll, put it, I'll publish it online. It's basically two Perl scripts. Um, right now it only works from an N900, but give me some more time and I might put it to other phones. But it's, it's there, it's fully functional, it's for N900, and you basically, all you need is a phone number in about you know, 10, 20 seconds, and you get, uh, get a, uh, well, given that the phone's on and does, and does MMS support the mess and goes out and fetches the stuff, it takes you know, less than a minute to get back the, kind of phone they have. Um, and it kind of, oops. so basically, actually again, it kind of looks like this in the previous um, picture where you go, go to the SMSC and say SMS submit, which is a WAP push, which is, ends up being an MS notification, which you send back to your victim, and the victim goes to your server, server stores the user agent, and then your phone goes to the server and say, you know that guy that just talked to you? Yeah, give me his user agent. And then basically you get his user agent. Um, and this is sort of kind of what they look like. So this stuff is very specific, right? There's no confusion there. You know, if it says iPhone OS 4.1, pretty sure it'll be, you know, the, the latest iPhone, right? And if it says BlackBerry uh, 9300, pretty damn sure it'll be a uh, BlackBerry Curve 9300. If it says the MIMO N900, it'll be an N900, and so on and so on. So this user agent stuff is very fun, it's very easy, and it's very, um, it makes it easy to go, if you, if you want to know what kind of phone someone's using without asking them or without ever seeing them, or knowing what kind of phone to have in advance. You don't need that stuff. All you need to do is send them one MMS. Well, one MMS notification here. Um, so I'll be releasing that code. Um, I don't have it online yet. Um, give me until after the conference, like the 30th, and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure it's on the IOActive website. Um, so last part, exploiting bugs. Um, again, as I said, I didn't get as far as I wanted to. Um, so I wanted to put more stuff in here, um, but I didn't get around to doing it. So I'll cover just uh, one particular one of the iPhone that I played around with. So when I mentioned that there's a, a bunch of formats, uh, that a lot of iPhone apps are riddled with formatting bugs, um, and so you run into this thing where they have these Objective-C format uh, methods, um, and they don't support percent %n, which is kind of annoying. Um, so which is the real, that's the really cool part about formatting bugs, that you get to write somewhere, right? So you don't have percent anymore, it's sort of taken away, you go like, well, gee, is that it? Can I only sort of crash the application now or leak some data using percent %s or whatnot? Turns out the format functions are even more different in the sense that they don't, not, they don't only not have the percent n when it's fired, they added one, which is the percent at sign. This one is very Apple specific, it's very Objective-C specific, but it's, very, it's documented and it's used all over the place. And this one basically says, um, it, it takes a, a, a pointer to an uh, NS object uh, from the stack and it calls a method on it, description with locale, or description, or if it's not an NS object, but it's a core foundation type reference, then it calls the core foundation uh, copy description func calls that function. Um, so that's fun because, well, you get to call function pointers. Um, which is a lot of fun because, one, it's a lot easier than, you know, because you don't need to know a bunch of addresses to write stuff to. And the thing with uh, general formatting bugs is that you got to sort of fiddle around and get it offsets right, right and stuff like that. And it's, it's kind of a pain in the ass to exploit, reliably exploit uh, general formatting bugs. This kind of stuff is a lot, more, a lot more fun. You just have a function pointer and that's it, right? So it's, 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 it's 
you don't have to fiddle around so much. Uh, of course, there's a couple he, um, hoops you've got to jump through. Um, and this stuff is not just specific to iOS. It's basically macOS, and uh, macOS applications can be exploited in similar ways. Um, so basically, I'll give a demo of, of consider the following uh, application and how it looks. And this is clearly a, a classic case of, uh, of, um, of a, a format uh, string bug uh, where you got, you know, you got uh, an argument, and then, um, basically, this is where you had a format string bug. Um, now, if you, if you will fire up a debugger and you run this stuff and you say, well, trigger this string and you're given four bytes and then you do one pop-up stack because you've got to make sure your address is in the right place in the stack and then you call the person at sign, it's going it's to going to get, take this four bytes as an address, which will be the address which is used as an uh, NS object. And basically, obviously, it crashes. It crashes in a method called Objective-C uh, message send. Um, and when it crashes, you can clearly see, you know, at least one of the registers is the exact value we want it to be. Um, so now let's go look and see what this objective C message send does, because that's the one that's going to go fetch the function pointer um, from the NS object. And once it gets, it gets the right um, uh, function pointer, it'll actually just call it. Um, clearly, you know, as, as we've seen earlier, we know we have full control of the pointer. Um, so let's see what mess object message send actually looks like. Um, I don't couldn't find any code. Well, I could find any code for it, but it's basically they wrote the damn thing in assembly. Um, so it doesn't look pretty, but it's there. Luckily, it's a very small function. <clears throat> um, it's, it's about seven or eight instructions. And I'll, I'll only briefly cover the ones we really need to understand what's going on and how to f build up your data in the, right, in the right way to get to executing a function pointer. So the, obviously, the way that the, the uh, uh, object C message sent API first works is that it takes the correct argument and puts them in the CX and AX um, uh, registry. Um, and then basically says, takes in the, um, and then the references the AX. And out of that, so out of this one, basically takes the, um, the pointer that we control, which is the 0x6262662. That one's the NS object pointer. So that's the point from where we start. Um, and then you get to here, which if, if if you go back and say and it crashes, this is exactly the point where it crashes. Um, so which is the objective rest sent plus you know the twenty third instruction. Um, that's where it crashes. The reason why it crashes is because it dereferences the pointer or an offset from that pointer, and gets uh, another um, and basically reads a pointer out of it. And from that pointer, it, the pointer read out of that one, it's going to be referenced again, so it's got to be some kind of structure. And I'll read out um, uh, an, a mask value from it and mask off a bunch of bits and then basically use that to calculate an address. Uh, and then it, it, it basically does, does this one. Um, so you want to make sure that that bit mask is set uh, to zero, because if you set it to zero, well, it's sort of this sort of weird little thing where if you want to get it right, you have to sort of fiddle around with it and it's kind of annoying. If you set the address message to zero, it sort of becomes very easy and it says just this one and then offset eight, which is the pointer that you read from that you control. Um, so you want to make sure the mask is zero and so things become a lot easier to do. Once that one's referenced, another pointer is read from it. Um, and it's very clear that it's a pointer because the first thing they do is once it's referenced, they say, is this a null pointer or is it not a null pointer? If it's a, if it's a null pointer, it's kind of, you don't want to go down that path because that one doesn't lead to code execution. Um, so you want to you make sure it's not a null pointer. You want to make sure that's a... Okay, I've got probably about more 10 minutes, so... Maybe, maybe five. I'm almost done. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, so once we know it's a valid pointer, this is where stuff gets interesting because what really happens here is they read out a structure which says um, has a magic value, has some value, I have no idea what it does, and then has a function pointer. Turns out the magic value isn't really a, a magic value, um, it's really a pointer except it's used as a cookie and that it's only used for comparison. Um, uh, so that means if, if you go and exploit stuff, you've got to figure out, it's basically the, um, the it's a pointer to the parent, if there's a parent class, point to the parent class, and then it's the way to match up if it's a child or not. Um, so once you get there, basically, the comparison is done with um, the original ECX value, which is um, passed in, which is sort of a, the pointer from the uh, parent class. 
And then sort of they say, is this compare, you know, is this one a child from this one? It says, if it is, jump to this location. And this is the one where you basically go, jump to this location. And what they do is they take out a function point from the structure and they say, call it. Bam, you're done. You got code execution right there. Now, obviously, this kind of looks, you know, like, well, it's a point here and a point there. And it sounds very complicated, um, but it's not really. It's, it's sort of, it's only a handful of pointers. And the other thing is you can, you don't only really have to know one pointer because you can make everything self-referencing. Take one base and then everything's sort of a relative offset from that. Um, uh, and maybe it still sounds a little bit complicated. So here's how you would do it. If you wanted, for, for one, get a, um, all you can do is have a pointer to a location where you control the content, build it up, I even, I got, put C code in there, build it up exactly like that, like that. Um, this, this is the one where, you know, it's going to point to executable code. This is how you do it, and this, you have this stuff on the stack, get a formatting bug, or an objective C formatting bug, given these specific values, and, that, and that'll give you code execution. That's it. I bet there are millions of questions uh, to you. Um, okay, where's the second mic? Over there. Okay, who's got a question? Any questions? Over here, blue sweater. <laughs> Please stand up and... Hello. Uh, thanks for the uh, very interesting talk. Uh, just a small comment. I think the fingerprinting doesn't work always because often uh, the mobile phones are configured to use a certain access point for MMS retrieving. At least in Austria, it's very popular that mobile oh, is that true? I only tested. Yes, only it's, it's typical for mobile operators use different access points for uh, surfing or for uh, retrieving MMS content. Well, that's, that's for billing. So that's very interesting to know. I, I had no because I've I've only tested this at home where I got a bunch of phones. All I can say is it works for clearly this. I can't generalize this stuff. It works for me. Um, I need to investigate more. But that's very interesting. I, I would love to talk to you later if you have more information about this. I'd love to know. Sure. Okay. Well, that's okay. Any other questions? Yes, over here. I'll give you my phone. A few. Hello. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, a few months ago I was playing with MMS stuff. Who was that? Uh -huh. Stand up? Okay. Some time ago I was playing with MMS stuff, and I'm not sure if I remember correctly, but I think I was able to fetch the MMS with my laptop, that it was a web address. Can you say that again? Uh, I, um, I think it, uh, the MMS was uploaded to a web server, publicly accessible web server that I was able to fetch it through a laptop. Do you know anything about that? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> well, no idea about that. If anybody does know, please let them know. Uh, any more questions? What? Great. No questions? Thank you for listening. Uh, okay, in that case, Ilya, thank you very much. Give it up. Well, enjoy your dinner and see you at 8.30 back here.